I, I uh, had the opportunity to spend a summer out at the Wolf Center in Ely, Minnesota. It's an organization that's uh, essentially, it's wolf.org, I think. Wolf.com, wolf.org. But it's an organization that, that its name is in support of another species. And at the time, I thought, uh, this is a great opportunity, and I got to learn and teach and whatever, and hang out with uh, younger people a lot. But uh, then I didn't meet John Way until yesterday afternoon. And, uh, you know, I, I said, well, I've been out to the Wolf Center in Ely, and he says, oh, David Meach and uh, Rolf Peterson. And these are the two top wolf biologists in the country. And he's like, they're like personal friends. And I thought, wow, you're going to give a good talk. John Way's out, he lives out on Cape Cod, and he studies coyotes, but he's also interested in the salmon, and I just really want to thank Christopher Haynes for finding him, because I think you're going to have a good time, and uh, I want to introduce uh, John Way. Well, thank you, Jim, and thanks for having me at this conference. This is great. It's been a great, I got here about one o'clock yesterday. It's been a great uh, event so far. Hopefully you'll enjoy uh, this next half hour or so that I'm here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the research I've done. Um, unfortunately, I'm not doing a lot of it right now. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about the politics, but the same agency that allows a six-month hunting season on these animals, they allow competitive contest kills, which would be mass wildlife. Um, has shut me out from doing my research. They've essentially blackballed me from, from putting radio collars in the same animal that you can buy a $30 license and blow unlimited numbers away, and people do try to do that here in Massachusetts. Um, so uh, a lot of people think our, our wildlife organizations, our, wild, our state wildlife organizations are really pro-wildlife, and they're really pro-keeping wildlife around to kill them. Um, so I want to talk about the research I've done, but just in the background, it's important to know, um, and I've written a detailed testimonial on my website that you can see there, that a lot of the research I'm going to discuss is no longer active because Mass Wildlife has, has actively prevented me from doing this work. And I'm working with some national groups on this, kind of like uh, climate scientists have had to have people defend them for publishing on climate change. A lot of carnivore researchers that are pro-preserving carnivores and not having them killed have had their career sidelines. And I can give you other examples of other people throughout the country. So unfortunately, this work that I've done, the books that I've published, are kind of on hold now, and I have a different type of job that, uh, that's unrelated to this research. But I do maintain my organization, Eastern Coyote Research, and I'm still trying to publish work, even without actively doing it. So I can talk with folks after if you're interested in that political dimension. But I do want to talk about this animal right now. Um, we call them many names here in the Northeast, coyote, eastern coyote, coy wolf, northeastern coyote. So these are synonyms for the same animal, just like mountain lions are also called cougars, pumas, panthers, and many other names, catamounts up in Vermont. Um, this eastern coyote lives throughout the Northeast. We're right in the heart of its range here in Massachusetts. They're the biggest type of coyote, but they're not quite as big as people think. So that 80-pound uh, coyote in your backyard that your neighbor saw was probably not 80 pounds. It might have been as tall as your lab. It looked like a German Shepherd. It was probably 40 pounds, but that's still a very big, quote-unquote, coyote. Uh, their track sizes are bigger because of their larger body size, and their color is quite variable because of their genetic background. Uh, so there's their track size out, out west, like Yellowstone or a place like that. Their tracks are about two and a half inches. And here in the northeast, they're about three and a half, and they're literally off the charts. Any field guide I've ever read for coyotes, including here in New England, say about two and three quarter inches is the biggest track, and that's kind of the smallest track I see for adults around here. And they're bigger. They're, they're clearly bigger types of, of quote-unquote coyotes, but I, as I mentioned, they're not quite as big as people think. Um, their jaws are more massive, and when we plot the data on their body sizes, that point on the far left is Alaska, uh, when we plot body sizes differences, there's really not much of a difference until you get to about Ohio, roughly Ohio there, latitude, longitude wise. And then as you get east into Pennsylvania, and then certainly the northeast, you clearly have a bigger animal. And when you compare them from western coyotes to eastern red wolves, this animal is right in the middle there. 
right in the middle of body size, bigger than western coyotes quite clearly, and on the, the smaller size of eastern wolves. And I just do want to not stress too much about this diagram, but all those dots are populations. So I have handled individual eastern coyotes, both a male and a female, that was 55 pounds, that's right here. But these are populations, 10 or more for the study that I published there. And not surprisingly, when we did genetic work, um, and I've collaborated with geneticists, um, we see that these animals are clearly hybrids. This is probably one of the more confusing graphs of the entire uh, weekend. But it's also one of the easiest graphs of the entire weekend, because what it's basically showing is canids, wild dogs, coyotes and wolves, like to mate. They like to hybridize. There's no black and white coyote wolf, especially here in the Northeast. You have in Algonquin Park, Canada, which is in southern Ontario, a more or less pure eastern wolf, also called red wolves down in the southeast. And then when you get Ohio west, you have more or less a pure western coyote. But when you get here in the northeast, all this green, you have an animal that clearly has western coyote and eastern wolf genes. And that would be our eastern coyote, or what I like to call them, coy wolves. Um, in the genetic package, and I don't need to get into this, any of the information on that, but the genetic package clearly differentiates eastern coyotes from eastern wolves and western coyotes. So clearly this animal is unique. It's always been unique. It's just that the genetic research has kind of caught up to what this animal has always been. So if you said, you know, I started seeing them in the 1980s and they were coyotes, yeah, they were the same animal. It's just now the genetic research is obviously more modernized and it's caught up to what this animal has always been, which is roughly two-thirds or a little less coyote, a little over a quarter wolf, and then a little bit of dog mixed in there too, which is interesting. We don't quite know how the dog genes got put into the wild population, but this is a genetic characteristic of basically our eastern coyote, northeastern coyote, or coy wolf. Most of you guys just say coyote, of course, here in the northeast. Most of our state fish and wildlife agencies, and again, this is a lot of political reasons, political reasons with carnivore management, but a lot of our state wildlife agencies don't even acknowledge this, don't even acknowledge this hybridization. But I do remind you, if, if you're not seeing that acknowledge, acknowledgeation from these groups, Mass Fish and Wildlife, Maine Inland Fish and Wildlife, we do have data, we do have scientific papers. Don't expect you to memorize all this. They're available, available for free down there on my website. Um, but we do have data that shows that these animals are unique. And there's just kind of a map. Here's, here we are right here, roughly. Here's just a map of this animal's range. As you go northwest, you get this more or less eastern wolf. As you go south and west, you get more of a western coyote. But as you get to the mid-Atlantic area, you get kind of a western coyote, eastern coyote mix. So if you're in Washington, D.C., you have an animal that's pretty much a western coyote, but it has some of the genes from the eastern coyote, so it has a little bit of wolf genes, but not as much as the animal around here. And the way that this animal was created was around about 100 years ago, early 1900s, we, had, we still have a population of wild eastern wolves in Algonquin Park, I mentioned that a minute ago. And around the farmlands of Algonquin, south of Algonquin, um, you get an animal that has a tough time surviving in the farmlands if you're a wolf. Wolves are not quite as elusive as coyotes. They get killed easier. They need to cover more land. And so this eastern wolf is highly closely related to the western coyote. As the western coyote moved east, they met each other, declining eastern wolf populations, many western coyotes coming from west to east, and they made it in this area of hybridization included a little bit of dog DNA. They, once they bred, they started colonizing and we, they got to the northern northeast around the 30s. They bred and, and started to increase in range in the 50s. They got to Massachusetts by the 50s as these guys were increasing in numbers and range. And then we know the story from there that they made it and then by the 70s and 80s they started coming east in Massachusetts. And then by the 80s to 90s, they really colonized all available habitat. And so for a good 20 years or so, maybe even more, they've been kind of saturated from Cape Cod throughout just about all the Northeast except for Long Island. They just have to get around that pesky area called New York City, which they're starting to do. There have been sightings in eastern Long Island, and that's about 20 miles of 
the most densely urbanate, urb, urbanation part of uh, the world, basically. Urbanized, I should say, urbanized part of the world. So whatever we call this animal, it, it's certainly adaptable. Similar to western coyotes, they eat just about anything. But they do really focus on medium-sized prey animals. Of course, a domestic version could be called cats at the right size of that 5 to 10 pound or 1 to 10 pound range. They do prey on larger animals where available. They can prey on deer, but deer can kick and kill. They can hurt wolves, let alone uh, this smaller eastern coyote. So they do prey on deer for sure, but their standard diet, their more common diet, would be these medium-sized animals. And they live just about everywhere, from rural to wilderness areas. And we heard them howling last night in Woburn, where I was nicely staying with Jim. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, however, is this edge habitat. This edge habitat that we provide, which isn't good for a lot of animals. We've talked about habitat destruction and the losing of natural spaces. That's certainly true. But what's happening is we're finding out that a lot of animals actually do quite well in those type of habitats. And the reason why they are in your backyard, but people don't think they should be in your backyard, is because they do very well around people. Edge habitat provides a lot of food for rabbits, mice, deer, and those animals provide a lot of food for the predators. So mountain lions are coming east, mountain lions are showing up in many developed areas out west, uh, eastern coyotes, and so are western coyotes as well. And eastern coyotes are kind of filling that role for all the carnivores uh, combined here in the northeast. But we have other animals like fishers. We have black bears moving east to eastern Massachusetts. So predators do pretty well as long as we kind of accept their presence. And it's not because they like living next to us, per se. It's because we provide good habitat even in our suburban areas for them. And that's not even including human food like garbage or pets. That's just natural prey items. You know, the human food's probably pretty obvious. If we leave it out for them, they'll eat it, but we probably shouldn't do that to keep them wild. That's just natural prey items that, when I'm talking about, provide good habitat. And there's a deer, of course, a medium-sized food item that, without predators around, can get super common. And they still are pretty common, even with predators around. And when, when we look at their relative danger level, we're looking at an animal that's really not that dangerous. About 1,000 people per day just here in the United States go to the emergency room from dog bites. 1,000 people per day just in the U.S. A couple dozen people are killed by dogs every year. If you live anywhere in the United States besides eastern Long Island, including any of the, the um, cities, you can pretty much bike to Coyote Range if you're not already in Coyote Range. Uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, all those cities down in Texas, all those cities have coyotes in them in their parks. Uh, Boston, of course, does too. Uh, there's been two fatalities in all of recorded history. Not to discount them, but of course, statistically, that's very small compared to uh, a couple dozen people per year getting killed by dogs. There's been a, uh, about a hand, a couple hand, about ten coyote bites in Massachusetts history. Most of those animals were sick or had something wrong with them. Uh, so the dangers of coyotes are very small. We have millions of coyotes throughout the North America. And there's under a handful of coyote bites per year compared to 5 million dog bites. So just some video that I took. And I mentioned some of the politicalness of uh, carnivore management. You can kind of do this unlimited amount of time for a $30 hunting license. You can kill them. And I'll show you some methods in just a minute. Uh, and it's difficult to study them. It's difficult to get permits just to study the same animal. So, it's important when we talk about successful animals, I know there's been other things with the climate being kind of dreadful and, and how do we, how do we uh, protect the climate, especially for the next generation. And one of the things that's going on in the carnivore and wildlife management world is how do we get equal representation in wildlife management circuses, uh, circles as well. So this is kind of a different but related topic that a lot of folks are working on nationwide. Uh, so these animals aren't fully protected. A lot of people think they are. It's more like in your neighborhood, there's, you can't shoot a gun, so they're indirectly protected that way, uh, more so than legal protection per se. And these are some of the ways that you're allowed to hunt them. You can use bait, as I mentioned. You can do it from a house, believe it or not, if you live 300 feet from another house. And I do know I've lost collared animals that I've tracked for a couple of years that I was very close with, not personally me and, me and her, but just tracking her. Um, and she was shot by a bait pile at somebody's house shooting ducks and not even eating the ducks, just killing the coyotes for 
that purpose. So these are things that are allowed. You can do that at night. You can lure in injured animals. You can now do them with contests. There's an active contest on Cape Cod as we speak to kill as many as you can. Kind of ignoring the, and sorry for the cutoff down there, that, that science indicates that predators are vitally important for ecosystem health. And just about everywhere I go, there's oohs and ahs, like I heard from you guys. And don't uh, be mistaken, you guys aren't alone. We're not just an isolated crowd here. The majority of people, the majority of folks, especially even on Cape Cod, which is a relatively conservative area, um, the majority of people do not support these. And I've worked with a professor from Salem State University, Jennifer Jackman, um, and we have quite uh, uh, powerful data that show that about four to one is a rough summary of this paper. Four to one, don't support unlimited bag limits, baiting, and, and things like that, let alone these hunting contests. So, so you're not alone, it's just, it's just how do we change this? So that first part was just to kind of introduce the animal, a little bit about its ba background, both bio biologically, ecologically, as well as politically. Um, but I want to focus, of course, in the remainder of the 20 minutes or so on um, the, what, what they're doing in the wild, what you, what you see them doing, and I refer you to the website. I maintain that. My, my email address is right on there. And I've done work on the north side of Boston, more in the Malden, Everett, Revere area, as well as down on Cape Cod. And depending on time, I'll show a little bit of video clips at the very end. And my goal, and what you need the permit for, is to capture radio tag and release them to study their ecology. Essentially, what are they doing in the wild? Um, how do they move? When are they active? Are they social? Where are their home range and territory sizes? Essentially, where do they live? Where do they have their pups? Where do they raise their pups as their pups get bigger? Those are all uh, questions that you answer by putting radio collars on and tracking them. Not just coyotes, but basically any other animal. Um, and some of the secondary objectives has been to take body measurements, body weight, and then the asterisk for the blood is that's how we got all the DNA results that you just learned about with this hybridization, this, this eastern coyote also called, called the koi wolf. And it is amazing. I know this is kind of a utilitarian standpoint, but when you get a collar on an animal, you can track them around 24, seven hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you don't care for sleep. Um, in about four years, this collar, a little bit more up close, lasts about four years. So, of course, before you get one of those collars on, you have to catch them. They don't just come up to you and say, put a collar on me. Um, so this would be the oxymoron of a smart coyote, because, of course, you could never catch his prey, the roadrunner. So we've used box traps here in Massachusetts. It's expensive to get them into the traps. Not expensive to get them in. It's expensive to buy the traps because they're expensive. But it's relatively hard to get them in because they're intelligent animals. They don't just walk into a trap. You have to convince them to go in. And when you use supermarket meat scraps to, to try to get a carnivore into a trap, you probably catch more than just the carnivore. You catch <laughs> many other animals. Many other animals like to eat uh, free bait, especially this time of year until the spring. And you catch some really oohs and ahs, like even on Cape Cod, we've ca captured fishers, which are in the weasel family. They're not cats. They're not fisher cats. Um, but even these guys, after a couple of captures, if you're not going to put a collar on them, get kind of old because you realize that your target, the eastern coyote, of course, has not gone in. But obviously I'm here because I was able to catch some. And we've caught many different ones, lactating females, which means you have them captured in the spring and they have puppies somewhere until you get a collar on. You don't know where they are. You see an imme immediate behavior of how they're successful around us. They're successful around us because they do very good around us by avoiding us. So they live near us, but they avoid us mostly. Doesn't sound kind of, kind of sounds kind of counterintuitive. They're doing very well near us because they're mostly active when we're not. You hear them howling in the middle of the night, usually not during the daytime unless a siren goes by. This, she lived to be 12 years old. She had heartworm, Lyme disease, like most of them do. Um, and she did not do it by growling at us. She did it by avoiding us, head down, ears averted, head away pretending she's not there. And then once we sedate them, I'm not going to bore you with the sedation process other than we sedate them. We take body measurements, we assess them. It's kind of hard to know it's a breeding male. A female's pretty easy with her, um, her lactation sign there. 
But with breeding males, you've got to study them in the wild. Large males, uh, large females as well. You, if it's not the breeding season, you've got to track them around and study their behavior with other coyotes to see how they behave, who's the breeder, who's the not the breeder, not the dominant one. And I've had the fortune of, of capturing over 50 individuals um, and some repeat captures, kind of bizarre. I think they forget what happens and there's a strong desire to eat a lot of food. If you are eating five pounds of food and you're 35 to 40 pounds after your, your trap lights, after going into the trap, that would be like us going to a burger, veggie or regular burger place and having about 80 of them after you eat. You probably won't want to eat for two or three days. So the food reward's pretty high for for the food in the traps, and that's how I think we've got them in there. And of course, I, I think this wilderness, uh, wildness-like setting, not in the wilderness, wildness, wildness-like setting in urbanized areas, is really appealing to a lot of people. We realize it's pretty easy to coexist with them and other animals, and having them around us kind of uh, enriches our lives. And I think that's an important, uh, in carnivores and, and um, canids in particular, really uh, bring that out because they are in conflict with us a lot. They eat similar prey items, they prey on our prey items, our domestic animals. Um, but the presence of carnivores, I think, is, is a sign that we have healthy ecosystems. Fishers have moved in, of course. Bobcats are coming back. I mentioned black bears earlier. Eastern coyotes are, of course, ubiquitous throughout the Northeast. And then once we get the collar on them, we get them back to their traps. This is a female, very wolf-like appearance. And here's kind of a summary of what you just saw with those uh, 15 or so slides is box trap, tranquilize, take measurement, see that they're a bigger animal, a bigger type of coyote with the tissue samples, radio call and release them. And then we'll conclude here with a little bit about their ecology down at the bottom that I just mentioned out loud. So I briefly mentioned that sedation process and it's very sophisticated. We, we prod them to one side of the trap and jab them in the butt on the other side of the trap. Not very sophisticated. And then we take pictures and videos. We're careful to put the collars on properly. We don't want them too tight or too loose. And we found that finger width fit works very well. And as they wake up, we uh, get them back to their traps and then we bring them back to wherever we captured that individual. And then of course we release them and, and see them run away. And we get a great view of their backside because they're trying to get away from us as quick as they can. They're probably under our care for four to six hours until they're fully awake and ready to go back to the wild. We don't let them go until they're fully awake. Yep, and j just like with any species, from sharks getting tagged off the Cape Cod coast to any other animal, each collar has a unique frequency, and that's how we know we're tracking animal A versus animal B or C. And radio tracking, as I mentioned, and I just have to highlight here, it's a critical way to discover the lives of these, these elusive animals, whether you're in a national park like Yellowstone or whether you're in a um, fully protected area, a non-fully protected area like here in Massachusetts. You want to at least have one animal collar to be able to track the pack. And you can track them in many different areas. And some of the major research findings that we've had, um, well, first of all, I've already gone over the major one for the genetic side, which was this hybridization. So we can jump right into the um, other findings, which is their behavior. What are they doing in our backyards, in our towns, in our state? Um, and that's to first realize that these animals are highly territorial. They have home ranges. All animals, including us, have home range. That's just the area that we use. But the, the de defining characteristic of, of especially canids is that they guard their home range. They guard their home range from others, and that's called a territory. So just about all of a canid's home range is a territory. So if you look at all these polygons, all these polygons are, are, are relatively non-overlapping territories with some older individuals obviously patrolling some bigger territories. That was a 12-year-old female there. She moved quite a bit. Um, and, and my theory quite uh, distinctly is the more we leave them alone, the more their numbers stabilize and we have less animals in an area. Because when you kill them, sometimes more animals show up than the original pair. I, I once had that original pack there. You can see that polygon. 
He died. And two years later, there were two PACs living in about 85% of his original territory. So basically, in, in rough numbers, you had two times as many coyotes living in this area than you had before that breeding male died. How many are in each pack? I'll get to that in just a second. Um, and the howling, and, and I wanted to talk about the role of communication, and I have some audio sequences I'll show at the very end, or I'll, I'll play at the very end, um, is, but why do you hear that howling? We heard that howling last night in Woburn. We got woken up at 12.30 from it. Um, you, you don't often see it. Here you see it, but you don't often see it. But the real, the, the, the function of howling is really twofold. It's to advertise that territory. And we have distinct evidence that um, not only by peeing on bushes can you recognize each other if you're a canid, especially if you live a long time, but you can probably understand each other and you can hear each other. And so it's literally to keep each other away from each other. And they also do it to find each other, intro within the pack communication. We communicate to protect with, from other packs and we do it to call each other, to find each other. And they probably uh, rally, I, I raise captive animals won't get into that now, uh, but they clearly like to rally each other just like we enjoy hearing uh, human singing. They probably enjoy it as well. But the real functions have nothing to do with us because they're living in our neighborhoods because of the habitat we provide, not because they want to scare us out of our beds in the middle of the night. And so within these territories, we have three animals living together. And they, they often communicate with each other. They, they howl to each other. They communicate with each other. They're the voice of the wild, of course. And that has all to do with their social organization. You can see four animals traveling together. A typical pack in one of those territories is three to four animals living together. That would be the, the parents, the breeding pair, often called the alphas, but they can simply just be called the parents. Um, and then you have a helper or two from the previous year, and those helpers raise new pups of the year, give or take April 1st. And so right around now would be the biggest a pack could be because you're at the stage where some of the pups, if they survived, are deciding to leave their parents. And the helpers probably are leaving their parents too on their second birthday if their parents are still there. Um, and those transients, the, 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 the animals that leave their pack become what's called transients. They, they go to new areas. They leave and go to new places. And so here's a pack up close. Whoop, we got some interference here. Let's see if the next slide shows anything. So the, the results for the activity pattern are not that. Um, the results for the activity pattern are, oh, I actually see it down there, but it's not showing me there. <coughs> So the results for the activity pattern, I can show you the bell curve, is that they're highly active at night, around dawn or dusk. Dawn here, they show about 50% activity. And then at dawn, I mean at daytime, excuse me, daytime they're, they're not very active. And then as dusk comes, they get more active, and then they're highly active at night. So they're much more active at night than the daytime. But these slides probably do a better job than the graph does anyway. Chill during the day, be active at night. Uh, this is a roadkill deer carcass, a wild pack of four animals. So they're much more active at night, um, and their breeding season's approaching us. Five minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, five minutes, perfect. I'm right about that pace, thank you. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Give or take April 1st, pups are born with, with a 60-day gestation period, two months. That would be roughly mating in late January, early February. So when we're really bundling up in the wintertime, they're really getting going for their whole yearly cycle. Um, and they mate around then, and they give birth in wooded den sites, even in areas like around here. They're typically finding natural areas. These football-shaped dens, basketball diameter size, uh, produce these pups. This is in Lincoln, actually, so not too far from here. And of course, the pups come out of them. Thank you, I did my hair that day. <laughs> and as they get bigger, they of course get more active. And, and what happens is, if you saw, I saw a den site or I have a den site in my backyard and you're emailing me in October, I'd be really cool 
that's pretty neat, but they probably haven't been in that den for four months. And they're like, what are you talking about? I had pups nearby me. Well, around June or so, they're, they kind of outgrow the den and they pretty much move to what are called rendezvous sites. French word for meeting up. Um, we could ask Simon that if Simon's here. French word for meeting up from yesterday, rendezvous. Um, above ground den sites, uh, they have these characteristics of water, of course, all animals need water. Thick, brushy areas to hide in, but they really like open areas. So they love open areas, but they also need cover. So cranberry bogs in Cape Cod and in southeastern Mass are ideal sites. Golf courses, swamps, cemeteries around here. Uh, the parents come and go to these sites. The pups' movements are predictable. You hear lots of howling, and that's because they're living with each other and they're guarding these areas, and they don't want interference from other coyotes in these areas. The parents often guard these areas, and they will chase dogs this time of year, so leashing dogs, especially near rendezvous sites, is always really important. And you can see the parents are always looking out for dangers with their pups nearby. And I've tracked animals. This particular male was nothing special, 35 pounds, average size, was about the size of an average female. He lived for over eight years. He raised the pups. He took as much care of the pups as the females did. In fact, this time of year, he took more care because I think the females were just uh, kind of anthropomorphically exhausted from raising pups. Once you get to July, their, their, their milk supply is dried up and they're... Uh, gladly to sleep away from them. <laughs> Here's a rendezvous site from the distance. And then the final finding here is their movement patterns and dispersal. And it's impressive if you're a distance runner, it, you, you can relate. They travel quite a bit. They love these human altered areas. Power lines, cranberry bogs, dumps, railroad tracks, even neighborhood roads, especially at night. You have a typical pack of three to four. Very simple math. 10 to 15 miles, you can have about 50 miles of track in one pack's territory, let alone other areas. And they communicate when separated. So you hear lone howling, often to find to meet up with each other. You know, you might see one traveling through your yard, but it might howl in a half mile away. There might be two or three others. And for them, that's really not separated. They can find each other in a couple minutes, just like we could run that distance in a few minutes. Even in urban areas, Everett to Malden, they can go through these holes and fences down cemetery steps. In Concord, not too far from here, they can go under Route 2 on this underpass. If you build it or dig it, they will come. Yeah, one minute, perfect, just about done. Um, they can travel far distances. This animal moved about 20 miles in one night. I won't go through the story other than it was a pain to track him. Um, you can see this is really what they look like when they don't have fur. This is a summertime, really two-dimensional body shape, kind of look like a skinny long-distance runner. But you get that fur, and they move even this time of year with snow on the ground. And when they leave their parents, they can move many miles away. This animal caught in Revere probably came from New Hampshire or Maine. We just caught her in Revere, her. She moved through Cambridge and down to the Rhode Island border. Other animals went from one side of Cape Cod to the other. This animal left Cape Cod through the canal, which is probably not a major obstacle, and went all the way up to Hingham, right, at World's End Re Reservation by the uh, Boston skyline. And in reality, their behavior prevents overabundance. Their population stable. You hear that howling, that communication that keeps them living at low, density, low densities. Once they get to an area, they saturate it pretty quickly, and then the young go to new places very quickly. That's how they colonize all of the Northeast in about 50 years, from northern Maine to southern New England. Um, it's because of their natural behavior, uh, their, their territorialism, their colonization to new areas. So I'll be glad to talk with folks, uh, depending on when questions are or after talk during break. Um, I have books available. I wrote a book on my coyote work. I wrote a book based on my Yellowstone experience, titled such. Um, so I'll be glad to talk with folks. I assume we don't have time for questions based on the one minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you.